In this video, we're going to learn about the idea of neuroplasticity, what that means and how it works. And at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about the number one way for you to promote neuroplasticity in your own brain, the research behind it, and how to know if you're doing it well. understand this idea of neuroplasticity, we can break it down into parts. So let's start with the idea of neuro. Neuro, that concept refers to neurons or the nerve cells that are located in the brain and the central nervous system. You can think of neurons kind of like you can envision a tree. So each tree has a trunk and so the trunk or the body of our neuron is called the soma. The soma has within it the nucleus, and it contains things like DNA and important proteins. From that trunk out extends the branches, and the branches of our brain cell are called dendrites. Under a microscope, you can see them branching out, and you can even see tiny little leaf-like structures at the end of them called spines. This is where information is communicated into our cells. The other part of this neuron is the axon, and the axon is like the root of the tree. And this is the part that communicates out, that sends information to other neurons. The place that these cells interact and communicate with each other is known as a synapse. And in the synapse, you will often find the dendrites waiting to receive the information and the axons waiting to communicate information out. Our neurons communicate both electrically and chemically. So there's an electric current that's sent down the axon, and in some cases, the electric current can actually speak directly to the next neuron. But in many cases, that electrical current releases a flood of chemicals. And these chemicals are called neurotransmitters that swim across the space from one cell over to the dendrites of the other cell, where they're picked up and communicate information. Now it's interesting that we have these neurons, but the sheer scope of neurons is really quite amazing. Researchers have estimated that there may be up to 80 to 100 billion neurons in the adult human brain, billions. Also, each neuron doesn't just connect on average to one neuron, but it can connect up to seven to 10,000 neurons, which is pretty amazing that all of those connections are being made. So if you added up each one of these synapses and all of these different connection sites, you would have trillions of connection sites. So you might think, well, we have so many, why does it matter if we lose a few? <laughs> and losing a few in the grand scheme of things might not be that big of a deal, but through normal age, we do start losing neurons and we lose synaptic connections. And if we look at diseased aging and different causes of the reasons why we may not have as many neurons or as many connections, it becomes much more concerning. For example, the plaques in between our cells or the tangles within our cells that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, the blood flow problems of cerebrovascular disease and how that can disrupt neurons, or even tiny little clumps of protein that accumulate over time called Lewy bodies can disrupt how our neurons function and how they connect. So there are a lot of ways that we can lose these uh, beautiful neurons over time and our brain starts to suffer from it. Now that we know the term neuro, referring to neurons, let's talk about the plasticity part of neuroplasticity. Plastic or plasticity comes from the Latin plastica. And this idea is that something is moldable or shapeable. So neuroplasticity refers to the idea that we can influence our brain cells, either by making the actual cell healthier and stronger, making connections between the cells more numerous or more robust, or even producing new brain cells with the idea of neurogenesis. While many factors influence neurons and neuronal connections, many people focus on the genetic aspect that they can't control. What's interesting is that from a genetic standpoint for Alzheimer's, for example, 99% of Alzheimer's cases do not have a direct genetic link. So instead of focusing on things that we can't actually control, it makes a lot of sense for us to focus on the things that we can. And the most heavily researched and modifiable factors 
are things that we can do in our daily life. A great deal of research has focused on this idea of neuroplasticity and how do we promote it through environmental or behavioral factors. So we are going to be combing through the research to help you understand what does it say about what you can do to influence your brain cells and the connections between them. Today we're talking about the number one way to promote this idea of neuroplasticity and that is aerobic exercise. Literally hundreds of studies show the connection between aerobic activity and healthier brain cells, healthier memory and other functions of our brain, and the idea that areas related to those functions are actually improved directly as a result of aerobic activity. For example, in 2016, a randomized controlled trial, which is one of the most rigorous forms of research, compared people. So a group of people with Alzheimer's were assigned to do an aerobic exercise intervention. And there was a group of people similar to them who had Alzheimer's disease, but they were assigned to do a non-aerobic toning and stretching regimen. Just six months later, the aerobic group showed on brain imaging reduced shrinkage in the hippocampus, which is a part of your brain that's crucial for memory functions. They not only showed this improvement in the cells of their brain, but they also showed improved memory functions on testing. Now we can talk a lot about individual studies and what they've said about exercise or other things related to neuroplasticity. We may do that in different videos in the future, and if you want me to, please comment below. But today I'm going to talk about a different type of study called a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is a grouping of numerous studies on the same topic so that researchers can take all of the data from these studies that were looking at the same thing and combine the data for a more powerful look at what are the effects of these things we're looking at. One of these studies, of these meta-analyses, was published in 2017 in a journal called Biomed Research International, which is a peer-reviewed journal. And whenever we're looking at research studies, we wanna look for studies that have been published in journals that are reviewed by our peers, so it's not based on potentially faulty science or opinion. It looked at 45 different studies, 117,000 data points, and spans of time lasting a year to 28 years that people were followed to understand what's the impact of exercise on brain functioning. Their striking results, literally striking, show that the people who exercise the most compared to people who exercise not at all or just a little bit, showed a 38% reduction in risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, striking. In terms of any kind of cognitive decline, the high level exercisers compared to people who exercise very little still showed a 33% reduction for any kind of cognitive decline. So this idea of being in the high exercise group, well, what does that actually mean? The way they defined it for these studies was that people had to engage in 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise at least twice a week twice a week all the way up to every day of the week. So this is pretty important to understand that some people were exercising two times a week and were still in the group that were receiving benefits as compared to people who exercise virtually never or a couple of times a year. This means that exercising even twice a week is a wonderful foundation that will start building brain health as you work your way up to the recommended idea of doing 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. You can package it any way you want. A lot of people do this in five or so days of a 30 minute bout of exercise. Now, in order to get this benefit from what this research is suggesting, they are talking about having a moderate level of exercise. So here's where we wanna get specific. If you go for your walk and you're walking your dog, and my favorite idea of walking your dog in this leisurely, lovely way came from a friend of mine in the past who used to describe it as the dog's reading the newspaper. You probably had a dog like that before that sniffs and walks and sniffs and walks and you walk along with them and it's lovely. That is not the kind of exercise that they're talking about 
for getting these cognitive benefits. In fact, your heart rate has to get up to a range that's optimal for you to be exercising moderately. One way to know if you're exercising in a moderate range is that you're feeling like you're working kind of hard. Your breathing gets a little heavier. You might start sweating after 10 minutes or so, and you can still talk, but you couldn't sing by any means. That's a level of moderate exercise. If you want to be more specific, a lot of people start paying attention to their heart rate. And in order to find your optimal heart rate for you, and it's different for everyone, there are ways that you can do this. You can, of course, go online. There are formulas that you can do. Take 220 minus your age, take percentages of that, and so on. You can do that easily by Googling um, aerobic exercise optimal heart rate. Um, there are also even online calculators so that you don't have to do the math yourself if you don't feel like doing that. And I will put a link to one of those below. Um, but if you have questions, if you're really not sure, maybe because you have some health conditions, maybe because you take medications that impact your heart rate, um, I always encourage you to talk to your doctor. Talk to them about your concerns about exercising. Talk to them about the right range of heart rate for you if you were exercising at a moderate level. And ideally, your primary care doctor would be able to talk to you about this, or they can send you to a professional who can. It might be your cardiologist, it might be an exercise physiologist, somebody in physical therapy, or even a well-trained personal trainer. Once you know the range that your heart rate is supposed to be in, well, then you have to figure out how fast is your heart beating. You can certainly take your pulse, while you're exercising and multiply it appropriately to get how many beats per minute. But a lot of people have turned to the use of relatively inexpensive and really easy to use health trackers. And they might track how many steps you take, they might track your sleep, they can track a lot of different things. But the aspect we're talking about today is that there are several of them that will track heart rate. So you can very easily, without having to stop your workout, look at your smartwatch or looking at your device and figure out your heart heart rate for that particular exercise session. Today we've discussed one excellent way to boost our brain cells and there is so much more to come. So feel free to check out my other videos on other ways to promote neuroplasticity, the research behind them, and how you actually implement it in your own life. You only get one beautiful brain and I'm here to help you bring the science of brain health home.